Okay. Welcome back. So in the first video, I just explained how everything works. In this video, I'm going to go into a bit more about the node system. So we saw in the last video that I could create like a file that in an XML like format could actually define the different nodes in the system by using this format here, like anchor pane, children, button, etc. There is also another way to do this that might better illustrate how, how we can do that. Let's say that I want another button put onto the anchor pane. So how do I do that? So if I go into my uh, main method, we can see right now we are only setting the scene and everything, but let's say, and everything is getting loaded from here, but let's try to do that programmatically. So if we go into the controller, let's say I want to add something to the anchor pane I used at the, for, at the button. So if I look in here, I can see there's an anchor pane, but there's no way that my program can, can actually hook into this because anchor pane doesn't have a name. So we're going to give it an FX ID in order to name it something so we can inject that into our program. And we can call it anything we want. So I'm going to call it top pane because it's the top one. I'm going to save that. And then I'm going into my controller and adding it as an instance variable. If I do like this FXML, it will get automatically injected. And I need to say private anchor pane. And then I need to uh, say top pane like that. I don't need to give it any value or instantiate it because it is going to be automatically instantiated because I did the at FXML here. So because the sample FXML specifies the sample controller as the controller, FXML automatically looks inside the controller and sees which ones are annotated with the FXML and then it assigns that top pane with the actual object that it creates from the file, which you might need to think about for a second in order to fully understand that. So by doing this code here where we load everything with this FXML loader, it automatically injects everything into our controller if we actually remember to type the correct name for the controller in here. So we see here that we use the same name, top pane and FXML. So it simply looks in here to see, is there any IDs? And do we need to couple those IDs with something, some of the instance variables in the controller? Another way to do this, and this is default behavior in IntelliJ, unfortunately, is to make it public. This way it will also uh, be given access to injecting it. But I think it's better practice to make it private so that only the application program from FXML can actually handle this one. So we're still hiding it from everyone else. We don't want to expose that to anyone else. Okay. So let me show you something else. So in order to actually work with these nodes, I need to kind of do something with this top pane. So I'm going to do that when, when we finish loading the controller, I want to start working with the top pane. I can't do that in the constructor because if I do it in the constructor, it wouldn't have created the top pane left yet, sorry. So I need to wait until after the top pane has been injected by the uh, JavaFX application. So they put a nice little interface that I need to implement for this to work. That is called initializable. So when we make a controller initializable, it means that you need to have a method. I'll say implement methods. You need to have a method called initialize. And this method of initialize, then you can work with whatever it should, it does this as the last thing after creating everything. And that also means injecting this correctly. So now I should be able to write top pane and then I can do anything here. 
A cool little thing is to look inside the uh, code here, I can see there's something called children. So I can kind of, if I don't know what to do, I can kind of guess. So if I say something like get or set, get or set, let's see if there's something called set children. No, maybe get children. There is actually something and we can see that children is an observable list of nodes. So there's two things to that. So observable list and node. So node means that it's actually the anchor pane has some children that is nodes and the anchor pane itself is a node. So it's kind of, it's a composite pattern where we can say that we have a class that is a node and this class can hold or composes is composed of either zero to many different other nodes. And then the node can be of different types. So we can have like a lot of different classes that actually inherit from node. And one of the classes that maybe not directly, we'll see that, but one of the classes is the anchor pane and another class could be the button. So let's go for that. It's hard to write in here, button. So this way, an anchor pane can hold buttons and the buttons can hold anchor panes because they are all nodes. And because nodes can hold itself, then we can actually have a structure like this. So this is why it's called nodes, because it's nodes in a graph um, and graph meaning it can be a tree or an associate uh, stru associative structure or something like that. So we can have uh, any different way these are put together. So let me show that in the controller for a bit. So now I can say top pane dot get children and we get an observable list. The observable list means that any changes to the children will notify the top pane. In other words, if we update the children of the top pane, it will automatically update the user interface to reflect those changes. So if I do something like this, I say add, and then I want to add a node and I could just, for example, say new button, my button. My button is just the text that's going to be on the button. Then we'll see that it will add another button to the top pane. Just after initializing it, we can see that my button goes here. The reason for my button to be at the top is because when the, a new button is initialized, it's initialized with uh, zero, zero. So it's initialized to the top. And the other one, if we look inside our we can see that layout X and layout Y is the X and Y coordinates for the anchor pane that we put the button. So this is also why that we see that this new button is at zero, zero, because this is the default value. So let's do something that might be a bit weird. So if I press my button, uh, the other button, I could move, uh, I could move it or something like that. So if I initialize this button in another way, like button B equals new button and then added it, I can actually do something. So let's do something. If I click this new button, let's move it. So I open this up in Scene Builder just to show another way of doing this. And I click this um, button here. I go to code and I say on action, I'm going to create a new method saying click button, something like this. And I click somewhere else and I save that and I close that. And we go back and see that now we have an action that is not uh, created in the controller yet. I create that method 
and we have an action event like that. And now I want to move the button B. Of course, I would need to define it as an instance variable for, for that to work like this. And then I can say B dot set layout X and I can set this to fifth, let's say 300, maybe too much, 100. And I can say B dot layer set layout Y to 150, something like this. And the reason why I'm doing that on the button click is just to show you that it's dynamic. It's not something I put into the FXML file. It's something that I have in my code. And because I have the button in my code now, I can change it. So if I click this button, this one should move. And I did something wrong, so it didn't actually move. Okay. So let's see what's going wrong here. Oh, it's the classic mistake. I reinitialized the button here, so it's only local to the initialize method. That's better. Let's try again. And it moved. So this way, when we are defining things in our FXML file, they are static. That means everything that doesn't need to react to our code and isn't dependent or something that changes, we can define that in our FXML file, whereas everything that we need to change and uh, over the course of the program while it's running, we need somehow to define it in here. So for example, let's say that we are creating something like a program that will fill out images or fill images into our graphical user interface. And we are loading these images from a web page or, a or files on a hard drive. Let's say we open up a folder on a hard drive. We want all the images to be shown here. But we don't know how many images we need to initialize. So we can't just go up here in library and then type image view and start pasting them in. Because let's say I put 100 of them in here, but there's 102 images, then we can't show all of them. So in cases like that, where we have changes at runtime, we need to be able to specify everything in code. And this is why the where this node system comes in, it allows us to dynamically uh, put um, layout, put everything into our graphical user interface. And because they are observables, they will automatically update without any problems. So I also put dialogues here. I think I'm going to save that for another time, but it's just that there are some built-in dialogues like alert dialogues and stuff like that, that you can use also. And these are not part of the node system. These are just separate FXML finished small uh, dialogues that you can use. So you don't need to do that all over each time. So that's basically it. That's it to understand what nodes are. And maybe you would also want to understand that a nice thing if you have the get children, you can also see that you can use everything that you can on a list normally. So you can also search the nodes, you can stream them, you can get them as arrays, you can add listeners to them. You can do a lot of stuff with these nodes. So if you want to manipulate them programmatically, we can do a lot of things with them and the GUI will be automatically updated. So that's it for the first part, the intro. The next part I'll try to dive into in this video I just showed the anchor pane and briefly we saw the grid pane being used but I'm going to just explain in the next video the layout types and then I'm going to give an example for each one of them. But that's it for now.